Well, good evening, everyone. We're only a week away from the election night. Well, actually, less than a week. By this time when, next week, we will have some part of the votes counted. Whether it'll be enough to declare a winner or not is up in the air. But So we have seven more days left to pray and ask God to accomplish and achieve His will through the American voter, which sounds like an impossible task. But as we saw in the devotions this week, the king's hand is in the the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, and like a river, he can turn up weather soever he wants. Well, not only is the king's heart in the hand of the Lord, so are the citizens of the kingdom. So the Lord can certainly move through us. I hope you'll keep that in prayer during this week as we move towards that election day. Also, November the 15th is our Operation Christmas Child Collection Day. The next Sunday is our Thanksgiving offering. So if you took home one of those red and green Christmas child boxes, be sure and bring it back on November the 15th. The church will mail those out for us. And then on the Sunday before Thanksgiving here, we'll be receiving the Thanksgiving offering. Our goal is $60,000. I hope you'll be praying about what you can contribute towards that. That money won't be spent immediately. It won't be spent for a year or two. We're going to set it aside and hope that builds enough so that when uh, TCA relocates to a new campus, we have close to a year's uh, equivalent of their lease so that we can make that adjustment without any undue uh, emergencies or stress or difficulties or trials. So let's have a word of prayer that we're going to talk about tonight, dealing with doubt. And this is an addendum to or a complement to the Sunday morning series on false teachers out of Second Peter. Let's have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you that we can gather together, whether it's here in the room or at live stream, that we can um, be contemplating the same principles and thoughts, and you can use it in our hearts and minds to solidify our faith. And I do pray for those who may be watching tonight or who may watch later who are struggling with aspects of their faith, that you will, through your Spirit and through your Word, anchor their soul so they cannot be drawn away by the whispers of false teachers. So we ask that you bless this study tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Before I go on, let me say thank you to all those of you who gave us such nice cards on Sunday. There were some very sweet words written and words of encouragement and affirmation. It was just wonderful. And for those who are watching on live stream, if you sent a card in, thank you for doing that too. So American culture is very much like the culture of Israel in the time of the judges. And when the judges, the time came to conclusion, it ended with the statement, and in those days there was no king in Israel, and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And I think that last phrase fairly accurately describes the United States of America. In Proverbs 21, Solomon says, Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the hearts. In Proverbs 14.12 and 16.25, they both repeat the same declaration. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. So there's an automatic pitfall in this dynamic in America and throughout human history of human beings doing what they think is right. And the implication is, apart from pondering the will of God, that even the most brilliant men put our minds together we come up with a plan such as the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States, which is probably one of the finest, if not the finest, governing document ever written. But today we are experiencing the flaws in that document. And the flaw is it does not provide the parameters for controlling the philosophical and political meanderings of man. But to do that, you would have to restrict freedom. So it's a, d a delicate balance which is why our founding fathers said that our Constitution was written for people who know how to govern themselves because that's what it provides is self-governance. But in the United States today, we have individually tailor-made opinions and beliefs and philosophies that carry much more weight than the values of tradition or American history. Now, America has always been individualistic, so this is nothing new, but our people shared a common Judeo-Christian foundation. So although America was full of individuals, there was this overarching 
system of values and morality that came from the Word of God or the Bible as best as people understood it. They knew there had to be some sense of justice, some sense of honor, some sense of sexual restraint, some sense of accountability to a divine being, and that individual rights were given by God, not by government. Everybody agreed with that. But the modern sense of individuality has greatly increased its diversity of those opinions and its intensity. And it's added a new element called canceling, canceling opposing, opposing views. America was built on the idea of free dialogue. Even if one group shouted down the others, there was still the open dialogue. But today it's shout and get rid of the other voice, eliminate the other opinion. That's very dangerous. And one specifically targeted group is evangelical Christianity. And sometimes it's narrowed down to white evangelical Christianity and then further narrowed down to white male evangelical Christianity. So that's being targeted. And we are seen as being anti-intellectual, even by other Christians who wouldn't consider themselves to be fundamentalist or evangelical of the right wing. They say that we are anti-intellectual. We are considered to be anti-science, anti-woman, racist, sexist, obsolete, and hateful. So we are in a day and age where if you just quietly hold yourself without verbalizing, the biblical principles of human sexuality, you would be dubbed a hater. If you dare to speak those viewpoints, you are practicing hate speech. And that is the atmosphere that we have in America today. That's the atmosphere in which young people are being raised in. That's the atmosphere in which questioners are questioning how they're going to live their life and how are they going to worship God and what are they going to believe. It's in a tumultuous time of discarding old beliefs. So while our culture rejects traditional spirituality, which we'll consider here to be biblical spirituality, it assembles a like a buffet line, a hodgepodge of, of paganism and animism and spiritism and atheism. And it's a buffet in which anybody can come along and pick what they want, whatever suits their desires and makes them feel good, and walk away and claim that they are a spiritual person because spirituality has been redefined to be in contact with something more than just your flesh, and that could be anything. And then the culture of the day can be very persuasive and passionate in its skepticism, in its cynicism, in its concept of self-rule, and its defiance. And so it will dismiss any morality that seeks to restrict the free indulgence of physical appetites, whatever those might be. And then there are some viewpoints that you're not even allowed to hold. Now, I'm saying all that to give you an idea. What you and I are struggling with as maybe believers over the age of 40 is the Christian world in which we lived and the world that allowed us to exist in their presence has dramatically changed in the last 15 to 20 years. It's no longer the same view of itself, and it no longer has the same view of us. The modern culture has no regard for the sanctity of life or free speech or the free exercise of religion unless it's being applied to those who support its agenda. So for evangelical Christians who might be what they would call right wing of persuasion, we don't really have the full freedom to hold our opinion and exercise it, even if, let's say, as a church or a Christian school, you don't feel it's appropriate to hire an LGBTQ openly practicing person as a teacher to children, that right to make that distinction is being removed. And it's being removed with a different value system being put in its place of tolerance and acceptance and, and inclusivity as opposed to biblical standards because our biblical standards no longer hold up to any kind of test of logic or reason in the mind of the world. So it rejects any beliefs that inhibit personal indulgence and self-expression, and the God of the new world is, is self. And you can see it on social media. I'm not really into social media much. I see tidbits here and there, but I know that because of Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, and then countless other social media venues, and then the Google search engine, all the world's viewpoints and beliefs that are out there 
can easily be accessed and pondered and considered and studied without ever holding them in the light of the Word of God. That is a dangerous dynamic, although in the world of free speech it must be allowed. But because the Bible has been so dismissed and discarded and degraded as irrelevant, these things are being examined without a standard for them to be held up to other than the standard of what popular person is saying this, what powerful group is holding on to this, who is controlling the information I receive, how is it moved up on the Google search engine list, where if you type in a subject, what articles are you going to see? For you and I to read about something, something is determining what we even get to see. And it's not us. Oftentimes what we want to read is not even available because one of these sites have considered it marginalized or, or improper or false communication, false information. So the great diversity in concepts of true and false, right and wrong, acceptable and unacceptable, leads to a lot of questions. And that's what I want to get to tonight. How do we deal with doubt as believers? Because questions are not bad. Every good teacher will tell you you should ask questions. Even questions that might seem to be questioning the validity of a strongly held opinion or belief, question it because if that belief cannot stand up under scrutiny, then something's wrong with the belief. So questions are good, but they can lead to danger based upon who the doubter or the questioner looks to for answers. And because the answers of the world seem logical, they seem intriguing, they're often very individually empowering, and they seem to include all the various viewpoints of the world, they can cause an unanchored believer to doubt the authority and the applicability of Scripture. And that's what I want to talk about tonight, doubt. Uh, doubt would be a feeling of uncertainty, a feeling or a lack of conviction. That doubt can lead to, dis to um, discovering greater truth. I think of when I began my intense Bible study, actually it was here in ninth grade when I took a theology class with um, Pastor Blackwell, Thiessen's um, Systematic Theology. I was taught on Sunday nights before church. And I attended that for about a year, and I got a taste for theological understanding of things. And I, it caused questions about things I would read that didn't make sense to me that would cause me to look for the answer. So bewil being bewildered, confused, or doubtful is good if you look to the right source for information. But if you don't, it can spiral you down into distrust of what you've ever heard before, indecision, hesitance, cynicism, disbelief, and the sad thing is eventually apostasy. So as much as we welcome questions and the logical assessment of long-held views, we should always be looking at them and meditating upon them and examining them. We must also make sure we always have the standard there readily accessible, which is the Word of God, which is where our church stands. Now, here's a very simple example of it. It's in the book of Genesis, chapter 3. And it's a story you all know very well, and you probably have heard these principles brought out before, but it goes in line with what we're talking about. How do false teachers go into a, a church or into a Christian denomination and with their words convince people to walk away from the faith? And it's happening much more often than it ever did, at least um, that's being recorded because of social media and the instant sharing of information, we now have many prominent believers who are openly saying to everybody, I'm leaving the faith. My mom and dad were preachers, or I was raised in this kind of church, and I am not only leaving the church, I'm leaving the faith. I no longer believe in salvation. I no longer believe in hell. I no longer believe that people are sinners. I no longer believe that Jesus is the only way. Yet some of them were pastors and preachers and authors. So what is making that happen? False teachers somehow are coming in and sowing seeds of doubt that the questions don't get answered and the person moves on. So here's what happened in Genesis. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, 
we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. So the false teacher here, the false prophet here, of course, is Satan himself. And he begins the dialogue with a simple, open, uh, an, an, a legitimate question. Has God said this? Now, that's not a bad question to ask because you and I can go look and see, did God say something? Because we have the, the Word of God. But he asked Eve, has God said? And he's asking it in a way to make her question, did I hear it right? Did I understand it right? Or did God even really say it? Because in the biblical account, we don't have God saying it to Eve directly. We have God saying this prohibition to Adam. So evidently, if the story is complete and we have all the information, Eve did not hear it directly from God herself. She heard it from Adam. And so she may already have some doubt because Adam has been telling her, don't eat of that, we're going to be in big trouble. But maybe she didn't hear it from God herself. So when she tells the serpent, she, she adds a phrase that either Adam told her or she came up with herself because the Bible doesn't say that God said this and that you shall not touch it lest you die. And some you know, Bible commentators say, well, Adam added it because of his great concern for his wife, Eve. He didn't want her to even eat it, so he put an extra boundary in, don't even touch it to make sure that she never actually ate it. And it's a, you know, if that's the way that, that played out, that's a good example of adding to God's Word and then there being a, a negative result from it. Um, if Eve just thought of that herself, it's the same basic principle, but it just happened, doesn't happen to be Adam's fault at that point. But she said, you shall not touch it. So Satan doesn't address that. He doesn't address, did God really say it? He gives that up. He doesn't correct Eve's incorrect portrayal of what God said to Adam directly, which was, just don't eat of it. He simply says to her, you won't die. So either God said that and it's not recorded, or Adam said it and it's not recorded, or Eve thought it up and it's not recorded, but Satan didn't even address it. That was irrelevant to him. His real point was to challenge the claim that God will hold you accountable. So then the, woman, the serpent said to the woman, verse 4, you will not surely die. Now that's a, a direct 180 degree presentation of a truth. That's Complete confrontation and contradiction. God said, eat it, you will die. Satan has gingerly worked up to that and simply said, you will not die. But he's already planted the seed of doubt in Eve's mind. For God knows, here's the reason, that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. Remember, he didn't say God did not say that. He asked her, did God say that, to get her thinking about it. And then when she states it, he said, Basically, God lied because you won't die. But God had a good reason. It's because your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So when Eve heard that, the Bible then says, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she couldn't come up with a reason not to eat it. And she took its fruit and she ate. And it's the, it's the temptation that is being presented today into the church of Jesus Christ. The temptation of personal empowerment and independence from God by being able to be like Him and have His power. And it's in much of the New Age teaching, long before the New Age got in, embraced by the church and incorporated into our teaching in many Christian groups, it's the idea that you and I can be God. And whether it's Gnosticism of learning the mystical secrets of the occult world in which you can lock into spiritual powers and make things happen and speak things into existence, mankind has been drawn and seduced into they want to have more power than they have. And if they're not a believer, then that power is to be exercised independent of Jesus. So 2,000 years ago, before Christ was crucified, Pilate asked him, are you a king? The Bible says Jesus answered, you say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. 
everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And Pilate said to him, what is truth? Now, in that response from Pilate, we see that Pilate is not of the truth. Because Jesus just said, everyone who is of the truth, who hears me say this, will believe it. Pilate's question is, what is truth? Which basically meant he didn't hear what Jesus just said. But it's not a bad question. So throughout history, that's been looked at as a, a bad question by Pilate, skepticism, and it shows his character. But in reality, it's a great question to ask. What is truth? And again, it goes back to, it depends on who you ask, whether or not that question has a good result. Here are some basic beliefs that are highly active in the world today that are being um, directed at believers, making them question, is what we believe really right? Atheism, <clears throat> God doesn't exist. Agnosticism, God may exist, but if he does, he doesn't care. Existentialism, it doesn't matter if God exists. Humanism, if God exists, he is us. Mysticism, God exists, but not as a person, as a force. Deism, God exists, but he's not involved. And the New Ageism, God exists in plant, animal, matter, energy, and spirits. So all those are different ways of looking at God. They're very general terms. But they are out there being discussed by intelligent people today, famous people, attractive people, influential, influential people who make young believers question the beliefs of their just everyday mom and dad. How does what mom and dad say compare to what this Hollywood movie star says or this rock star says or this great athlete says or, or this world leader says? That's just mom and dad and my local pastor. But in the church, some other things have developed within the church. Number one, I think, is the most deadly, universalism. That all life has been reconciled to God. And then they'll put on there the caveat because of the death of Jesus Christ. So it sounds Christian, but it makes an inaccurate claim that nobody needs to get saved because everybody has been reconciled to God because of Jesus Christ. And then there's some universalism that doesn't even take the time to add the gospel, the crucifixion to it. It's just everybody is okay. The second would be legalism that salvation is secured through works. That goes back to the Judaizers of Paul and Peter's day, that you have to work for your salvation. You cannot receive it. You must be good enough to obtain it. And then that has some, some peripheral viewpoints of if you die, you must then pay for your sin for a while before you're into heaven because it's still a matter of works and you must observe certain sacraments to be worthy of salvation. All that falls under legalism. Then you have spiritualism. And that is that spirituality is not rooted in the gospel. But spiritualism is rooted in interaction with spirits. And you'd be surprised how many Christians have embraced that in terms of who they receive wisdom and insight from. They say they believe in Jesus, believe in the Bible, but they're communicating with spirits and having voices speak to them. Back in the 60s, uh, one of the um, great horoscopers of the day, Gene Dixon, who did all the daily horoscopes and told futures and was a spiritualist, she claimed that she was a Christian. And because of that, many believers thought it was okay to read the horoscope because Gene Dixon was a Christian, and she's telling us this. But a believer does not receive information from spirits. Uh, but if you lose your discernment and you don't look at the Word of God as being authoritative, it's just one of the things you consult. Why can't you consult a palm reader? Why can't you consult somebody who can speak to the dead? And why can't you uh, deal with a spiritualist? And the fourth would be ritualism, that Christianity is exercised, not exorcised, but exercised, and God is realized through sacred rituals. So if you want to interact with God, you must observe some rituals, whatever that particular group might hold on to be true. In the Native American culture, there's often the practice of sweat lodges, at least in the Western tribes. The sweat lodge in which they will go in and have a hallucinatory 
out-of-the-body experience and meet a spirit guide. Well, back in the 1990s, early 2000s, there were Christian groups who were engaging in sweat lodges to get into a transcendent state in order to communicate with the God of the Bible. So it, the, the term is called syncretism. It's when Christianity takes other beliefs and tries to match it up with Christianity so that we can also reap the benefits of that belief system. And what it does, it, it pollutes and dilutes the black and white truths of the gospel and the Word of God. <clears throat> I like to say for young people who might be watching this or if you're going to be talking to your grandchildren or children about this, biblical faith is not irrational. It's not um, just some blind faith in an ancient book. Christianity and biblical faith is logical. It just has presuppositions. And the presuppositions are that God exists, that He can be known, and that He's revealed Himself to us. So because we believe in those three presuppositions, our faith is built on what we can glean from those three realities, that there is a God, so what we interpret as evidence of His presence must be true because we believe that He is. He's communicated to us, and we have it written in the Word, so we can rely that the Word is accurate, and we, we can know Him because He has revealed Himself to us in nature and in the Word of God. You set those things aside, everything we believe is irrational. So the world, which does dismiss those three things, think that what you and I believe is irrational because they don't have the presuppositions that we have, that God exists, that He has revealed Himself to man, and that we can know Him. In Romans chapter 1, Paul explains that dynamic this way. Since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen. And that's a play on words, but it's a very powerful one. His invisible means you can't see Him. Attributes, qualities, characters, virtues are clearly seen. Being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because, although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. And then this famous phrase, professing to be wise, they became fools. So, Paul makes this indictment against the human race, saying that all of us are without excuse because God revealed Himself so vividly and so clearly with the evidence all around us that somebody made us and we are designed and created by a maker. We have thrown that off and instead, Paul then says, we have worshipped the creation rather than the Creator, although we knew better. Describing it as an, as an intentional turning away. Very similar to what the men of Israel did when, saw, when, uh, excuse me, when Moses was up on the mount a little too long. And they said to Aaron, hey, make us a golden calf. Because we, we, we've been in Egypt for long enough to know, gods, you, you can touch them. You can see them. They're in statues. They're in temples. Make us one of those so that we can pray to him. And Aaron did that. And it was so grieving to Moses as he came down with the Ten Commandments that he threw the commandments down and shattered them because they had violated the very principle of biblical faith and that God is a spirit. You can know Him, but you can't see Him. You can just see the evidence all around that He exists. So how does doubt and disbelief, and I have to say this incrementally, how does it incrementally get into your life? Here are a few means or open doors. Number one, disappointment. When you and I are disappointed, we are expecting something that doesn't happen, and we often look for an explanation or a reason or a logic behind it. And if we can't find a reason behind the disappointment, it grieves us to the point we begin to question. That leads to disillusionment. Disillusionment is the concept or the reaction that, well, then what does it matter? If I believe that and nothing happened, then what does it matter? And you become disillusioned with the truths that you've been told, which leads to great discouragement. 
because now I have no hope. If what I believed all this time doesn't really work and doesn't make any sense and doesn't uh, match the real world, then I am left alone with what happens in my life, and I've got to solve it because my parents certainly didn't figure it out. The people in my church haven't figured it out, and somebody 2,000 years ago certainly didn't figure it out. So now it's up to me, and they get discouraged with everything they know, and they tend to then disrespect authority because of that. Fourthly, then, then comes the deception. Whether it's a book, a movie, a personality, a friend, but somebody comes into their life or information comes into their life that appears to have the answers so powerfully <coughs> that they are deceived into believing, well, now I know what it is. And for some reason, atheism seems to be the answer because people have a hard time understanding why good people suffer. It doesn't make any sense. And when they can't make sense of that, their answer is, well, then God must not exist. Because if God is all-powerful, all-loving, all-knowing, and all-benevolent, He would certainly stop everything I see. That's the man's viewpoint, looking out and looking up. Man rarely ever takes the position of God's viewpoint and asks the question, why does God love any of us? Why does God save any of us? No one seems to complain about that weird dynamic, that seemingly contradiction. The holy, righteous, judging, authoritative, powerful um, judge of the universe loves unrighteous, sinful, wicked man. Nobody complains about that dynamic. What we complain about is why we suffer. And so that deception comes in and it develops a deep discontent. If you're discontented with your life and you're looking for, that might come from disappointment or disillusionment or discouragement or deception, but when you become discontent, you look for a substitute. You look for something else that will satisfy. And Satan has, as we talked earlier, a smorgasbord, a, a buffet of things you can choose from. And young people or even people who have been Christians for years, if they take the Bible and they set it aside and they don't, they don't consult it, but they consult the wisdom of man and what sounds good and what's endorsed by successful or happy-looking people, they can embrace that belief system. One of the reasons why we go into discontent and, and disbelief is when things don't fit our reasoning. And I'll, we'll see a highlight of that in just a moment and we'll close, but... When, when things don't fit our reasoning, and I want just to make sure you understand, as human finite beings, our reasoning is incredibly limited. <clears throat> Think of people like Albert Einstein and the geniuses of science, long before there were computers, who figured out things in their head about the, the, the aspects of light and the aspects of energy and black holes and supernovas, and they couldn't see them with a telescope, they couldn't... They couldn't do research on a computer, but they could reason it out. Even that kind of reason is not enough to figure out God. He is beyond the human mind. So for us to believe and know Him, He has to reveal Himself. He has to enlighten us. He has to make our spirit alive because God is known through the spirit. He's comprehended through the mind, but He's known through the spirit. Or whenever what you believe doesn't resolve your pain. Let's say you are a person in physical pain or emotional pain, and you are not finding resolution for it in the Christian faith. That can make you look outside of that to some other form that can numb that pain in your life. Or when what you're doing as a Christian and what you believed or have been told works doesn't change your situation. That can make you think, well, because it didn't work for me, it must not be true. And, you know, when I was first saved, I heard many testimonies of people who were on drugs and they got saved and gave up the drugs immediately. But then there's some people who got saved and it took them a while to give up the drugs. Some of them got saved, took them a while to give up alcohol. My mother took her years to give up cigarettes. Now, whether or not cigarettes is a sin or not is, of course, debatable as maybe wine might be. But in that day and age, it was considered a sin for Christians to smoke in evangelical circles. So my mother was confronted with that every day after she became a believer that it's a sin to smoke. 
yet she had to, through great diligence, she had to work to give up cigarettes. So when it comes to a physical addiction, sometimes our physicality takes longer to catch up with our spiritual maturity than simply instantaneous. But there's always those stories of people who were complete drug addicts who got saved and the next day clean and sober. And it makes everybody else wonder, well, it didn't work for me, so maybe I didn't get what he got. Stories of healings are the same way. The pastor who led me to the Lord was miraculously healed from cancer when lightning struck his pickup truck as he had his hand on the handle. His wife was actually inside the truck, and she was sitting on the, um, the upholstery. Lightning struck the truck. It blew him back. He landed on the ground. He had been given four months to live. And that bolt of electricity, whatever it was, burned all the cancer cells out of his body, and he was healed. Well, that was his story. That's not a recommended means of, of a cure for cancer today. And if you have cancer and you have to go through chemo or radiation or surgery, and if it eventually takes your life, it doesn't mean that the miraculous power of God did not work in your life because that gentleman who was healed of cancer, I believe he's passed away now just from old age. Death comes for us all. But because it doesn't change your situation, it doesn't mean it's not true. And lastly, when it, when it doesn't match your wishes, God is not a genie, and uh, it's not Christian faith to crank up enough energy, rub the lamp, and then God's going to give us <coughs> what we want. But some people think that's what it is. And when it doesn't happen, they question the whole system. I want to close with this comment from Job. And although it's tough and it's hard, and I have sympathy for all those who are struggling, and this seems so black and white, <coughs> But Job had an existential crisis. Job went through horrendous suffering. And he's questioning the reason behind it. And what is this all about? And, and he's lived for God. He hasn't done any sin that he knows of directly and intentionally. So there's, there's no context for all of this. And his friends come and they talk to him. And they, they reason it out and come up with all sorts of incorrect answers. And then God shows up. And he says, who are these people? who are sharing wisdom out of darkness or who are trying to enlighten the situation when, when they don't know anything. And they talk to Job directly. After he gets done talking to Job, and in his talk with Job, and I know you know this, God doesn't give any answers to the questions. He doesn't say, well, Job, this is why it happened, and this is what I'm doing in you, and this is what people are going to learn from it throughout history. God doesn't tell Job anything behind why it happened. God just says, Job, do you know who you're talking to? Do you know who I am? And God talks about himself. So when he's done, this is Job's response. Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand over my mouth. Once I've spoken, but I will not answer. Yes, twice, but I will proceed no further. And he later says, I abhor my flesh. Humility. Submission. Surrender which leads to faith. And when doubt comes into your life, the answer is not going to be found in more reasoning and twisting and dissecting and deconstruction. The answer is going to come the same way it came to Job. Compare your trials and difficulties and questions and doubt to the authority and power and wisdom of God and submit and surrender and have faith in Him. It's an easy answer to speak but it's the hardest thing for people who are caught in doubt to voice. It took Job a long time to get there. But he got there, and it saved his life and set a tone for the rest of us throughout history. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we tonight as we pray, we think of those, maybe even in our own church family, who are struggling with profound doubt. Certainly those throughout Christianity who are discarding evangelical beliefs and a trust in the Scripture and even a belief that you exist and they're throwing it to the side because they couldn't make sense of what they were seeing in the world. And Father, that scenario is happening more and more in our culture that has so many opinions and so many views that are bombarding our young people. Father, we pray that your spirit, through your word, will 
will deepen our faith and broaden our base that we might share with compassion and kindness and loving authority the certainty of the Word of God so that our those who follow after us won't drift in the faith and won't be pulled away by the false teachers that Peter is warning us about. May we be secure to the truth. For we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless each one of you for coming tonight. And for those who are watching on live stream, I hope that this discussion gives you some things to think about, to ponder, and uh, maybe even to prepare your, the foundation of your own life to go a little deeper because the questions are coming. And you and I be, need to be able to have an answer. God bless you. Have a great day. And we'll see you on Sunday.